But anyway, let's read Matthew 28, 16 to 20. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray before I begin. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can gather together. Thank you for your word. Please be with us now as we look into your word and see what it has to say about growing and that as we do, you would be working in us to grow us more like Jesus. Amen. So as you all know, we've been working through our church vision statement, the four Gs, gospeling, gathering, growing and going. And so far we've done the first two Gs, gospeling and gathering. Gospeling being that we become disciples because of Jesus, that he has saved us from our sins, so we can be wholehearted student followers of Jesus through the gospel. The great news that Jesus died, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures for our sins. Sorry, I got the order mixed up there. But that's from 1 Corinthians 15, isn't it? So now then, we are disciple-making disciples, practicing and proclaiming the good news. And then we looked at gathering last week, and we saw that as disciples, it's important to gather, together. Why? Because we've been baptised into a community with God the Trinity and with other believers. We've become God's people, and so we're called into a community with each other, with Jesus as the head, or the cornerstone, or the vine, depending on whichever metaphor you're going to go with. So, now what? We're saved, now we gather, and then what happens next? Well, now we grow. So this is point two. What is growing? Growing is something we all do and experience. We see it in our children as they grow intellectually and physically. We see it of ourselves. We see growing in nature with plants and animals. Growing is part of life. So I want to be clear now on the type of growing we're going to be talking about today. We're not necessarily talking growing in terms of church numbers. In other words, getting more people into church. In my mind, that's part of going. Uh, And so you know, where we go out into the world to all the nations to share the good news of Jesus and therefore make new disciples. No, today I want to look at our growth as disciples in terms of our own knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, born out of obedience to his commands. So to do that, I'm going to break it down the following areas. Uh, First, what is a disciple in terms of growing? Then Why is growing important as disciples? And then look at what do we need to grow as disciples of Christ? So what is a disciple in terms of growing? So in verse 19, the command is, go therefore and make disciples. But what's a disciple? A disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Christ. Bernard gave us that definition at the beginning of the series and Jess reminded us again today, uh, a disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Christ. So let's break that down a little bit. So wholehearted, meaning that it encompasses your whole life. It is now your everything. It is your new identity. Jesus is Lord of your whole life. Student, this implies intellect an ability to learn, an ability to grow in knowledge and understanding. And if you're a student, you need a teacher, which connects beautifully to the next part, to be a follower, implying relationship. You've got to have somebody to follow. You don't follow someone you don't know, so there must be a connection. 
Follow also implies action. You can't follow if you're sitting down in one place, not moving. It's physically impossible. Following requires some action. Following also implies obedience. There's going to be directives, instructions, commands given by the leader, the one you're following, in order to follow correctly. So a disciple has got to listen to these commands, listen to the teaching. We see that up in verse 20, the idea of a student and a teacher, of a follower and a leader, when Jesus says, teaching them to observe or to obey everything I have commanded you. So being a disciple, therefore, is a lifelong commitment of obedience and involves continually learning from the greatest teacher you'll ever meet. It involves continually growing in your relationship with the perfect leader as he leads you by his word. So there is a lot to being a disciple. So why grow? So this is point three. Why grow? Well, because Jesus is now Lord of our life. If we're truly disciples, then Jesus is not just Saviour, but Lord as well. That's there in the Matthew passage, isn't it? Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Growth is the product of Jesus having lordship of our lives, which is made evident in how we then live lives of obedience to his commands. In John 2, verse 3, it says, This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. There's the evidence of growth, of a life truly changed, to no longer have sin in the driver's seat, but Jesus. We know we will grow when we have Jesus as boss. How does that then play out? Let's go back to the reading Ros brought us from Ephesians 4. So I'm going to read from verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Growth through obedience to God's teaching is for the purpose of reaching unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. We grow in our knowledge of Jesus, of who he is, of what God has done through him and is continuing to do. We are growing towards a more intimate union with Christ through knowing him more and more and then living lives of obedience to his commands. If we are following him, we need to know him. And knowing him more, we'll love him more, knowing how amazingly good and gracious he is towards us, which will then make us want to obey more, won't it? The word until there, uh, in verse 13, this directs us to the fact that full maturity in our growth will only happen when Jesus returns. Until then, we'll keep growing more and more mature as disciples, as we listen to and obey his teaching, growing more and more in our relationship with him, but that will only reach its fullest when we are united once more with him in the new creation. Until then, as we live lives of obedience, growth is expected. So why grow? Because if Jesus is Lord of your life, then growth is expected. It's an expected, continual process involving full obedience with the result of a deeper relationship, a living relationship that will one day reach its ultimate. But what do we need to grow? Now, Jess outlined what we need to grow as people and then indicated one of these things that we need to grow as disciples. And so I want to expand on that some more now. Uh, But the first thing that I'd say we need is to be saved by the Son. Have a look at Ephesians 2 with me. It's one of my favourite verses. I love Ephesians 2. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were dead. That's pretty definite. 
Dead meaning not alive. Yeah? Dead things, dead people don't grow. They decay. But living people grow. Have a look from verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. By the grace of God, we are made alive. Jesus has not rescued us, but he has resurrected us. And here starts the beginning of our growth. We are made alive with him. This is our new identity, alive in Christ. And as we saw earlier, growth is expected of living things. We can't grow without Jesus. I mean, thinking back to Matthew passage, we know that he's got all authority over everything. We therefore grow because our lordship has changed. He's made us alive So obey. So how do we find out more about him then? How do we then grow in that relationship? This leads to the next thing. We need sustenance from the scriptures. We need God's word. In our Matthew passage in verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Our growth as disciples is reliant on the teachings of Jesus. And where do we as disciples in the 21st century find this? We find it here. In the Bible. Let's just pick apart this teaching thing for a minute there too. So who is Jesus talking directly to at this point? His disciples. Is the 11. These people who had been following him around everywhere, witnessing what he'd been doing, listening to what he had been teaching, they were all getting the first-hand experience, weren't they? But after Jesus returned to heaven, what did these disciples then do? Well, they went and they started making more disciples. How? Well, they spoke the truth. They spoke the gospel. They taught using God's word, looking at the promises in the Old Testament, and then teaching how Jesus fulfills them. The book of Acts is full of examples of Jesus' disciples making more disciples and teaching them the good news of Jesus through God's word. They had the Old Testament and their first-hand accounts. We have the Bible. But why, why use the Bible? Because the Bible is the revelation of God and his plan for this world through Jesus. At Youth Group, we're working through God's big picture. Uh, In the first week, we spent a lot of time looking at the fact that the Bible is one book, and that it has one author, and it has one subject. And that author is God. It's a familiar verse for us all, I'm pretty sure. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. All scripture is inspired by God, and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the human authors of the various books of the Bible were inspired by God through the Spirit and wrote down exactly what he wanted. So really, when we read the Bible then, we're hearing directly from the source, aren't we? Have a look here at 1 Peter 2, 2 to 3. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow up into your salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted the Lord is good. In other words, if you've met Jesus, if you know Jesus as Saviour and Lord, feed on his word. Notice the use of the word pure. God's word is pure, meaning there's no additives, right? It's perfect. You want to grow in your salvation, or like we saw in Ephesians 4, in your faith and knowledge of God's Son, then feed on the pure word. Spending time in God's word is so important. It's our food for growth. That's why it's part of everything that we do here at church, 
We have so much of God's word in a Sunday service. Because if we're gathering as a community with God and with each other, this is how we hear from God. We need to be feeding on it, getting our sustenance from the scriptures. So speaking of church, that leads on to the next thing that we need. We need to be gathering with God's mob. I want to come back to the Ephesians 4 passage. In verse 11, you'll see there's five different ministries listed. All of them are centred around the teaching and the proclamation of the gospel. The purpose of these ministries is then outlined in verse 12, uh, to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. We see here one of those uh, wonderful images used in the New Testament for the church, the body. Uh, So as we meet together as the body or as the church, there are those from verse 11 whose responsibility it is to see to the equipping of its people for ministry and for the building up of the body. In other words, they're there to help facilitate the growth of the disciples through the teaching of God's word. That's pretty clear back in the Matthew passage, isn't it? He said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So how we grow then is through our new Lord's teaching. Now, verse 14, this outlines the danger of listening to false teaching and its detrimental effects. It's to the extent that um, Paul's used the image of little children, those that yet haven't grown, those that haven't matured. Then we get to verses 15 and 16, and it says, But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building it up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So the truth is central to our gathering. The truth meaning the gospel teaching that is centred on what God has done in Christ and is doing and will do through and in him. And as we meet, there's the aspect of caring for one another as we speak the truth in love. Why? So we can grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. We speak the truth to each other. We hear it proclaimed as we meet. We care for one another as we speak the truth. We want to see each other grow. True church growth has Christ as the goal and Christ promotes that growth. The last thing then uh, for growth as a disciple is the practice of prayer. Prayer, I think, is important in two ways. One, it shows our dependence on the Father and it then shows our love for his church. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus is talking about prayer, it says in verse 8, Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. Let me say that again. Your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. So if he already knows, why pray? Why do it? Because it's a sign of our need for him. It's our reliance on him. It's us saying, You are Lord of my life. I can't grow without you. We then also need to be praying for each other. Remember the image back in Ephesians 4, the body speaking the truth to one another in love. If that love and care for each other is true, then bringing our brothers and sisters before the Father in prayer is a wise thing to do. That they would hear and obey the teaching of the Lord of their lives and learn, and grow from it. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4 says, First of all then, I urge the petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Saviour, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We're called to be a praying people, a people that pray for everyone. And what more important thing do we have to pray for than for people's salvation? And then to be growing in that salvation, learning to obey the Lord's teaching. 
I love that bit in verse 3 uh, where it says, This is good and it pleases God our Saviour. Do you ever think about that? That praying for others to know Jesus more pleases God. That is, for me, a wonderful encouragement to pray more. Okay, so I'm going to sum all that up. Here we go. So we had, what is growth for the disciple? To be growing in the love and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ through obedience to his commands. Why do we grow? Because that's what expected of a true disciple. Growth demonstrates our obedience, our continuing desire to know Christ more and to deepen our relationship with him. And what do we need to grow? Well, first, you need to be saved by the Son. And then we need to get our sustenance from the Scriptures, gather with God's mob, and enjoy the practice of prayer. So I'm at the last point now. What next? How does this look Monday morning? To quote from another preacher who comes up here. Or to twist it, how is this going to affect you now and then as you go out to morning tea? Okay. First, I think there's four things to think about. First one is this. How are you going? How is your personal discipleship going? Have you been saved by the Son? And if so, are you getting your sustenance from the Scriptures and enjoying the practice of prayer? Intentional time every day, reading God's Word and praying to Him is so important for individual growth. I mean, you essentially end up having a conversation, don't you? You read the Bible, God speaks to you. And then I speak back, praying. If you find reading difficult, reading the Bible difficult, or you think, I just don't know how to start or what to do, that's okay. But make sure you come and speak to one of the ministry team today. We can help point you to resources or strategies or all sorts of things, or we can read with you. Don't let not knowing what to do stop you. Instead go, hmm, I'm going to get motivated and do it. This is important for our growth. Second, are you gathering with God's mob? I'd say I'm probably preaching to the converted here because you're all here. But uh, we've seen this week and last week how important it is to gather. Are you making it a priority? And not only that, But then how do you walk into church? We all come with different baggage from the week, different stresses and difficulties. Uh, Some come just with difficulties of getting to church this morning. Um, But as you walk into the gathering on Sunday morning, are you walking in and praying, how can I serve others this morning so that I can encourage and build up others as they grow as disciples. And then after church, do you start your conversations not with how are you going, but how are you growing? See what I did there? That's pretty good. Um, So third one. This one is sort of an offshoot of the first two. Um, How can I then be discipling those around me during the week? As parents, we've got a really important job. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 points out our responsibility for the discipleship of our own children. So am I spending time with my children regularly, teaching them the goodness of God's word? Outside of that then, um, how can I be encouraging others during the week? Good things to do. Bible reading, one-to-one, or prayer triplets, or Bible studies. Mate, I wouldn't grow anywhere near as good as I do without my Bible study group. They're fantastic. So can I encourage you, if you're not involved in a Bible study group, get in one. They're great. Because as disciples, we want to pass on the teaching of Jesus to other disciples. And the fourth fourth one, last thing, what are the things in my life that are preventing growth? There's lots of opposition to growth. Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower, is a great parable for considering what are the things stopping or hindering growth as as a disciple. Could it be that you don't fully understand yet the amazing grace offered through Jesus? 
Is it that the desires of this world are pulling at you? Temptations that the devil throws at you, his distortions of God's good plan and order for this world. As it said in 2 Peter, are you feeding on the pure word of God or are you feeding on worldly junk food? Are you letting your priorities dictate how you spend time with God or are you letting your time with God dictate your priorities? Oh, yeah, there we go. Let me finish by coming back to this passage from Matthew. In verse 20 it says this, And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. As we seek to grow, as we read God's word, as we gather together to build one another up, as we disciple and as we are discipled, as we are obedient to Jesus' commands, let this verse be an encouragement for you. Jesus is with you always to the end of the age, working in and through you. We can't earn our salvation. That's been done for us. The one who did that has promised to be with you as you grow, promoting that growth. So why don't we let him? Let me pray. Lord God, thank you that you want to be with us. Thank you that you want relationship with us. Thank you for the ways that we can grow. Please help us to put our relationship with you first, to want to grow in our knowledge of who you are and therefore in our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.